forward to a, a very interesting evening. I see we've got a, a wide geographical spread um, looking at the, uh, the chat function now. So without further ado, I will hand over to um, Nigel to tell us whether AI can be ethical. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can see me and I'm going to uh, share a screen, first of all, so that I can uh, bring you some, well, visual eye candy and perhaps some uh, enlightenment, I hope. So let's have a look and I will switch to... Okay, so there we go. We should see a, a splash screen and um, can a AI be ethical? Uh, I kind of uh, uh, represent uh, three institutions in a sense. Uh, Oxford, of course, as a university, my college, Jesus College, where I'm fortunate to be principal. And uh, also uh, I'll reference the Open Data Institute, which I founded with Tim Berners-Lee and of which I'm executive chair um, almost a decade old now. So it is great to be with you. Um, I regret we can't meet in person, uh, despite the genius of the technology that brings so many of us together virtually. And I do look forward to those times again, but it does allow us to abolish the tyranny of place and space. So that's a good thing. So the topic of my talk is, um, can AI be ethical? Um, it's a huge one, and I can only really give you a, um, a flavor of this. Um, in the 50 or so minutes I've got to talk to you. But we do have a good amount of time for questions, so I, uh, I would love to answer any of those you might have. So my academic life has been in AI. Um, back in 1978, I began my career in the Department of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. It, all, it was a heady time back in the, in the 70s, uh, but we were under pressure um, a notorious review in 1973, the Lighthill Review, had recommended the closure of virtually all AI research in the UK. Right from the outset, the subject has enjoyed periods of boom and bust. And currently, I think it's fair to say that we're in a period, we're in the sunny uplands, at least in terms of funding and interest. But AI has been making key contributions to computer science. Um, right from earliest days. From programming languages to hardware, from methods and techniques to fielded applications. And ethics has been a feature uh, throughout all of that. So um, let's set aside the kind of rather uh, intriguing uh, Android-like figure here, uh, reflecting on the various challenges of AI ethics, and just go back to a quote from uh, Wiener, Norbert Wiener, the father of cybernetics, 1948. He wrote, it's long been clear to me that the modern ultra rapid computing machine was in principle an ideal central nervous system to an apparatus for automatic control. And long before Nagasaki and the public awareness of the atomic bomb, it occurred to me that we were here in the presence of another social potentiality of unheard of importance for good and evil. He wrote that in 1948, a quite extraordinarily prescient uh, comment, given that you know, the Manchester Mark I hadn't been built. You know, we were still we were still in the process. But we do know that the origins of our subject of computing itself and many of the founding fathers and uh, the, the great kind of people working in this area, often, sadly, through the. Uh, through the um, trials and tribulations of conflict, they had begun to see what was possible with computing. And of course, famously Turing with the Enigma machine and the, and the bomb, which with Welch, uh, they built an electromechanical device to decrypt uh, the work subsequently of Flowers and the building of the Colossus computer. Von Neumann's work on computing, which helped in calculations towards the uh, engineering of the atomic bomb all the way through, um, computing has had this uneasy relationship with how it's being used. It's not a surprise, and um, computing, along with many other of the key scientific developments, is a dual-use technology. Almost as soon as humans get their hands on a scientific breakthrough, whether it's in chemistry, 
apply to chemical warfare as well as manufacturing or biological science applied to germ warfare agents as well as antibiotics or indeed nuclear insights which has already mentioned directly applied to weapons of mass destruction as well as providing power and light and many other benefits so these emergent breakthrough technologies um, often do present societies with a whole range of challenges. Science and technology has always offered up ethical dilemmas and choices, how they should be deployed and used, who should have access to their benefits, and how should they be made safe? Who should be responsible for their development and deployment? This has seen attempts to control our new scientific potentialities via conventions and treaties, codes of conduct and modes of use, regulation and law. And uh, we're seeing that, of course, with AI itself. And we'll reflect on, on how that's going. Uh, the actual attempt to imagine a general EU regulation of AI, how could that work? What might that look like? So the particular developments in AI uh, seem particularly um, rich in generating ethical challenges on an almost daily basis. So why does the question seem so pressing and why the urgency? Well, the obvious question is, uh, the obvious fact is that AI is everywhere, whether it's in our autonomous vehicles or the phones, the supercomputers in our pockets that do everything from recognize our voices to our faces, to answering questions on the web, uh, general questions that are made sense of by natural language understanding systems linked up to huge uh, resources that can answer a huge range of general questions all the way through to telemedicine, AI applied in robotic surgery, a whole host plethora of new deployments that bring with them particular challenges. All of this made possible I would say, not just by computer scientists, we owe huge amounts of our success to our colleagues in materials engineering, in electronics, who have kept the exponents of change running year in and year out. Now, this is one of those uh, log uh, linear uh, graphs, traces a straight line. Um, this is, of course, Moore's law, which plots transistor density against a year of introduction of the particular uh, chip. And uh, every time I give this, when I gave this uh, talk before lockdown, it had a uh, Apple uh, 13 chip as a uh, state of the art. We're already uh, now looking at Apple's M1, which boasts 16 billion, uh, essentially 16 billion transistors. Depending, it's even difficult to count and assemble reasonable metrics on compute. Uh, capability now because of new innovations in how multi-cores are used and how these things are packed into three dimensions. But the remarkable fact is that in my career in AI, the devices I used to undertake my AI research have increased in power six orders of magnitude, at least a million times more powerful in terms of their processing. And no subject cannot be disrupted when the underlying raw power available has changed to such an extent. It changes everything. Now, this is a, a well-known uh, um, image taken from Kasparov's game. In It's 25 years, more or less, since Deep Blue scored its first success over the world's strongest chess player, um, 1996. But it was the following year that sent a shudder down the spine of many in 1997 when Deep Blue beat Kasparov in a six game match. And it's something around the unreasonable power of computing combined with algorithms that can direct search heuristically. It gives a sense of agency to those systems. It gives a sense of agency to the discussion of these systems. And it literally can un un unnerve us. It suddenly unnerved Kasparov. He said at the time, I'd played a lot of computers, but had never experienced anything like this. 
I could feel, I could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. That kind of view takes a grip on our minds and our imaginations. Now, we might well want to reflect on whether we believe, of course, unnerved though he was, the system was in no sense anticipating his psychological states. It had nothing in there that was proud of the fact that it had won, gained ascendancy. It was simply searching between 100 million and 200 million positions a second. Impressive, of course, but not remotely like the methods employed by a human and not the slightest sense of a job well done. But here was a challenge to human ascendancy and supremacy. And there was a great deal of doom and gloom at the time, including the machines coming to take all of our jobs. Well, just about two decades later, in March 2016, there's this lovely image which has another human world-class performer with his head in his hands. This is Lee Sodal, the, one of the world's strongest Go players. That same look, well, of despair and disbelief as AlphaGo beat him. Now, the match that defeated Kasparov the machine behind uh, um, that defeat, Deep Blue, was one of the most powerful computers in the world. It was running about 11 gigaflops, so 11 billion floating point operations a second. The 48 tensor processing units that beat Lee Sodal were running at 11.5 petaflops. That's 11,000 million million floating points operations a second. That is in some sense a machine a million times more powerful than Deep Blue. Those changes, those exponents, have been a large reason why both the methods and techniques of modern AI and their apparent effectiveness or their real effectiveness has been so um, jarring, so stunning, so remarkable to those of us who have witnessed decades of AI progress. And actually, that was just the first of a trio of remarkable achievements by um, the UK's own uh, AI-founded and quartered company, DeepMind. Next, there was AlphaCraft, DeepMind's AI program that became ferociously good at the multiplayer strategy game, StarCraft. And at the end of last year, there was AlphaFold. AlphaFold, a program that has made a dramatic inroad into a significant challenge for science, the challenge of protein folding, hugely important in helping scientists design the drugs of tomorrow, working out using a whole range of constraints in molecular physics and chemistry, how proteins naturally fold together in a way that will deliver a whole host of insights in future drug discovery, and uh, understanding the whole field of proteomics. And actually, just today, the announcement of Alpha Code, which those of us who program will be wondering what the uh, impact of that system will be, a system that is reasonably good at writing code. What will that actually mean? Now, over the decades, um, AI has developed a whole series of methods and techniques to build smart intelligent systems. Uh, back in the day um, when I was uh, first building knowledge-based or expert systems, we had a range of methods from theorem proving, rule-based programming, structured object representations. And the way we built systems back then was essentially to try and elicit domain rules from experts, code them in a variety of ruling coding languages, often throwing in a, a dash of uncertainty reasoning uh, to deal with uh, um, uh, complete or uncertain, incomplete or uncertain uh, information, introduce structured hierarchies. So here we've got a few rules that uh, might uh, help us in a, a simple um, expert or knowledge-based system for uh, medical diagnosis. And you can actually make sense of those rules as you read them. You know, if a, if a white blood cell count is less than 2,500, 
uh, if a white blood cell count is less than 2,500, then you categorize that as a low white blood cell count. And if there's a low white blood cell count and a fever, then you can suspect a particular sort of infection. Infections come in different shapes and sizes. You can organize them in a hierarchy of types. And on the right of the slide, you can see a set of subtypes of a uh, gram-negative infection. And those structural principles, in fact, AI uh, was uh, one of the prime originators for the whole field of object-oriented programming. Those have been influential and powerful methods. What we can uh, see more recently is the emergence of a whole new class of methods that originate out of work in neural networks. And it is these uh, new networks that have created uh, huge excitement. So this uh, slide's kind of illustrating the major components of modern deep neural learning approaches. And you'll see that what I'm representing here is layer on layer of connected nodes. Actually, each node, uh, each layer is usually a matrix, but uh, leaving that aside, learning occurs by adjusting the weights of the connections between each of the various nodes. And ultimately, there's uh, um, feedback into the system as it, um, as it uh, attempts to make classifications. Now, depending on the style of learning, a system might be presented with many examples of labeled inputs, which it has to learn to classify into particular output types. In other systems, there's actually no pre-labeling required, and all the software attempts to do is optimize an output value, a performance score. And the illustration I'm showing here is a system that was trained on hundreds of thousands of images of skin lesions. And it learned to classify the outputs as uh, various types of benign or malignant lesion, performing as well as some of the best human experts. And off the back of these types of architectures, we're beginning to see the beginnings of AI systems augment, match, and in some cases outperform human experts in a whole field of tasks. Whether it's looking at images such as retinal scans and predicting potential disease states, or applying a combination of machine learning techniques, natural language analysis, and graph-based reasoning, rule-based and representational reasoning across graphs uh, to discover and characterize new drug types. Uh, this is work from Benevolent AI. Um, and uh, as a member of the board, I've seen this company uh, really in the last couple of years develop a, a suite, a mixture of AI methods and tools that are really bringing uh, really uh, augmented uh, drug discovery uh, with human expertise to the fore. And of course, there's Oxbotica, our very own Oxford uh, autonomous vehicle um, uh, company. Uh, you're going to get a little bit of uh, music ch chiming away here. But this is their uh, illustration from just, just recently of trials in southern Germany, where they were demonstrating the use of their software platform to guide accurately cars in novel environments uh, to great effect. So these are impressive results. But whether it's drug discovery or driving cars, or indeed in this case, what is a, a, a well-known application contents, the use of machine learning methods, AI algorithms to determine justice outcomes, there's a whole host of ethical questions that start to emerge. So predictive policing, can you actually work out from the patterns of data where crimes occur and locations where you might want to deploy or pre-position your law enforcement? Are we really confident that the systems being used in biometric identification are fair and balanced, not susceptible to a whole range of biases that are starting to become uh, apparent as we do more work in this area, or indeed systems that have been applied to set bail or sentencing even of uh, people who have been convicted of crimes uh, in the US. 
or the more systemic applications we see, uh, the Chinese deployment of so-called social credit, where citizens are essentially monitored a whole, across a whole suite of their behaviors, and AI algorithms are used to recognize those individuals, to recognize patterns of behavior, and to allocate scores that determine how effectively you're re rewarded or given access to public services how and whether you are regarded as being uh, an engaged and constructive citizen. These are the kinds of um, dilemma with the application of AI methods that are clearly redolent and full of ethical questions and challenges. So it's perhaps no surprise that one response to all of this has been a flood of AI ethical codes and guidelines. Governments and large tech companies, NGOs, multilateral organizations, think tanks, universities, writing up their AI codes of conduct, the various ethical codes of practice. And, and what you're seeing scroll up before your eyes here, hopefully, is is something of the 84 codes of ethical guidance that were published in a special issue of Nature Machine Intelligence in 2019. What that work actually did, that uh, uh, Nature uh, Machine Intelligence article did, was do a meta-analysis on those various codes to try and uncover the repeating principles and patterns, the top themes, if you will, throughout all of the codes. And that's kind of represented here in a little wordle. Um, what were the themes that kept coming out that seemed to be important in the codes that were being written? Well, you can see some of them here. One of the most um, prominent in all the codes and prevalent was transparency, understood as efforts to increase explainability, interpretability, and other acts of communication and disclosure. And I'd submit that a lot of this has to do with the preponderance of deep neural networks. So let's just reflect on that for a moment. The problem is that neural networks can too often appear to be black boxes, layer on layer of connected nodes encoding an incredibly high dimensional space, huge matrices of weights that somehow encode the decision-making of the train system. And it's to these that I want to just kind of pay a bit of attention. What does transparency mean? Access to code, to the design rationale, to the data it was traded on, an effective explanation of the decision-making itself. And the internals of a deep neural network present a challenge. When we were dealing with our earlier generation of expert systems or their improvers, we could see the explicit lines of reasoning. The rules could be recapitulated in natural language. So if the patient had a white blood cell count of less than 2,500, then we know they had a low white blood cell count. And such rules apply in chains of reasoning. And if we want to know the reason for the determination of leukopenia, there it is, it's explicit, leukopenia, definition of a low white blood cell count, it can be traced back to a rule. It can be contested. That rule might vary from country to country. But the challenge in a neural network is how we can do that for behaviors. In a weight matrix, doesn't necessarily feel like an answer. I should say there's considerable work, technical work underway, to get inside the black box, a whole subfield of what we sometimes called AI neuroscience, methods and techniques to understand what is going on, or so-called feature visualization to somehow try and decode the intermediate layers to see what part of a problem they might be responsible for processing. But it is still a challenge on decoding the black box that is the neural network. Another topic that came up in the codes that were analyzed was uh, non-malfeasance, uh, a kind of do no ill um, related to safety and security. And there's 
a really interesting, I think, challenge here in modern AI. So let's take our modern neural networks and um, take two neural networks. One's classifying images and the other's doing its best to find ways to find patterns that will have a high probability of being misclassified by the first network, its adversary. And this is done, so-called adversarial networks. So the network on the top is reliably identifying objects as a soap bubble or a peacock. Meanwhile, another network is generating images that it seeks to try to get the other, the first system to misclassify with a high degree of confidence. And there you can see something that looks a little bit like uh, static on a color TV. Those two images were reliably being classified as bubble and peacock by the first network. Now, this is literally a kind of arms race. The question then is, how can you be sure that the models that you're training are robust, can't be subverted? or indeed that the data you're training them on hasn't been subverted in some way or other. Now, there is work underway in this area, uh, some of it absolutely being carried out by um, uh, colleagues here in Oxford. This is the work of Marta Kwiatkowska, who does work on trying to work out the confidence intervals you might have when you're looking at networks, which we know in this case can be uh, misdirected, uh, very small perturbations in images can lead to dramatically um, different outcomes than you might desire. So we're looking at how in these cases you can provide confidence limits around the ability of networks to deliver uh, stable and reliable results. But again, this is an actual arms race and the whole work between those who wish to prove that there are backdoors, attacks, which people who want to subvert these networks, classifying abilities or other abilities uh, can get at is robustly being countered by people working in security in these areas, trying to work out how they can detect such backdoor attacks or guarantee that the behavior of the underlying algorithm, the network, is robust to these sorts of uh, attacks or perturbations. Now, what about other things we care about in the ethics of our AI developments? Well, a cherished concept in our various ethics codes is privacy and autonomy. Back in 2008, and top left of the, this slide here, you can see a book that my colleague and I, Kieran O'Hara, wrote, uh, The Spy in the Coffee Machine. We imagined a world in which a whole range of AI and surveillance techniques might come into existence. Uh, we didn't imagine the speed with which that would happen, I have to say, even in 2008. And we didn't actually think they would literally build a spy in a coffee machine and sell it on Amazon, which is what you can see uh, just below the book there. But there have been all sorts of concerns in this space. One of them has uh, been around the whole area of so-called smart toys. And there's a particular challenge for us here in the deployment of AI methods to children. And a clear example is the so-called development to smart toys. So teddy bears that have all sorts of AI augmentation, not always with the most careful of safety and security engineering. Um, in 2017, a company called Cloud Pets produced Internet of Things teddy bears, which managed to leak 2 million parent and kids message recordings. A company that sold smart teddy bears leaked 800,000 account credentials, and then hackers locked it and held it up for ransom. So there are huge issues here around governance and control, balancing the rights of citizens and consumers with a technology that is being rapidly deployed. And that's before we get on to the um, friends or strangers we've invited into our homes to listen to our conversations, to answer our various questions, whether it's a well-known um, IoT home device from a particular provider or another provider. And then there's a the question about 
the concentration of data. One of the striking features of the modern internet is the extent to which a very few platforms have extraordinary power and dominance in terms of data aggregation. And subsequently, as we discover, the ability to use that data to build very large models to drive their machine learning. Now, in my own group, we've worried about this quite a lot, um, just at the level of data concentration. You take one aspect, which is the data flowing off of your phone to various destinations. And in this work, we actually took um, a, a number of applications, a large scale analysis of applications, in this case from the Google Android Play Store, where we could actually get the, uh, the apps and do various forms of static and dynamic analysis to track where data was flowing uh, through the ecosystem and uh, what kind of data was being taken off the system. So here's a, a, a little illustration of a particular app, in this case, Airbnb, what it was harvesting and where that data was then being forwarded onto. Now, this view of the data ecosystem, the mobile data ecosystem, is one that presents all sorts of ethical challenges before you even get to the question of what AI is applied to the, uh, the data that's been harvested. All sorts of issues around market access. In fact, the CMA, the, Co the, the Competition and Markets Authority, very interested in understanding these sorts of flows. But as yet, there's very little technology, there's very little, indeed, regulation that, re that enables regulators to get inside of these ecosystems and fully understand where the data flows are, what the impact of one tracker company taking over another or a company being acquired by one of the big platforms, what that does to market concentration, whether there's real competition in the data that's being read off. And of course, should that data be being read off in the first place, has consent been obtained? Are the obligations under uh, regulations such as the GDPR actually being followed? Hard to answer at scale when so much of the actual ecosystem is opaque to uh, researchers and to regulators. So uh, in work that colleagues and I did, we actually try to bring this uh, to the fore. And I think it's, it's interesting to reflect on the fact that before we get into questions of the algorithms, determinations that are being uh, fed the data, there is the antecedent question of how ethical is the data, the wider data ecosystem within which these systems are located. And we have variously called attention to this uh, and are at the moment uh, contributing to a number of consultations in this space. Now, these sorts of concerns are one of the reasons why my colleague Tim Berners-Lee and I started a project fairly recently uh, funded by the Oxford Martin School here at Oxford, a project we call AWADA or Ethical Web and Data Architectures. And, and here, part of the ambition is to is to think about whether there are different architectures, not just technical, but institutional, that could arise. The web has become very centralized. What would it take to decentralize it? Uh, Tim has been leading on a project called SOLID, uh, Social Linked Data, in which a new set of protocols um, that sit alongside existing ones can actually allow individuals to keep and maintain a degree of control over their data. In some sense, the programs come to the data rather than the data being harvested and then the programs apply to it. There's a whole range of interest now around decentralized architectures, so-called edge-based computing, that might add counterweights to the concerns we have about data appropriation. And it's not just about the technology. The question we have is what sort of institutions do we need to design um, to repurpose and steward the data in a way that serves a broader set of goals and not just the platform's goals? We're talking at the Open Data Institute, and I'll mention this perhaps later, about data institutions, data trusts, data cooperatives. 
those are in some sense institutional architectures that serve a different purpose than simply selling or consenting on to your data being harvested and concentrated in one particular platform space. Of course, there are lots of other challenges in this area rather than just working out a decentralized set of protocols. If you're going to decentralize data, then one of the questions people have is, well, don't you lose all of the insights that you might gain by consolidating data and running patent detection over it? So surely the trade-off is that if we do that, we lose the insights from machine learning. But there is a really interesting uh, field emerging, so-called privacy preserving machine learning, where attempts, serious attempts that are showing real promise are showing that you can leave data federated and still extract patterns collectively over it. A range of privacy enhanced technology approaches are looking to try and give the user guarantees around their identity and their data being kept in some sense anonymous, but still allow for aggregate detection of patterns across collected data. Now, I wanted to um, spend a little bit of time talking about developments here in Oxford around the fundamental challenge of ethics, ethics as a discipline. Because I think it's clear that one of the things that, uh, and even in the BCS, um, uh, for many years, there's been a recognition. I mean, ethics isn't a new concern for computer scientists. There have been professional codes of practice, and the, uh, as I say, the BCS have been promoting these for a number of years around responsible design, around uh, getting people to think about the impact and, and appropriate ways of designing their software. But there seems to be a particular concern about how we might want to develop ethical codes for AI. And I think I'd like to just spend a bit of time about how we see the discipline of ethics itself bringing its thinking and methods to bear on that. So in Oxford, we have the particular good fortune of having an extraordinary rich history within the university, particularly within the Department of Philosophy, of ethicists. R.M. Hare, uh, Iris Murdoch, um, Derek Parfit, um, Warnock, people who were either trained at, studied or researched the whole domain of, of ethics. Fundamental questions on what actually mattered or what the notion of values meant in a structured way that you could organize a framework of ethics around. All of these approaches are fundamentally about values. They're about notions that we've seen in the codes we've already detected of transparency and accountability, transparency being key, privacy and autonomy, dignity and self-determination, equity. So that needs the development of sustained and careful thought and scholarship. Ethics isn't just about having a cheerful list of things you prefer. It's about trade-offs. It's about understanding the complicated competing interests and perspectives that will relate to any ethical challenge of any complexity you're facing. And there are fundamental concepts at play here. And what we've been able to do at Oxford off the back of a, a, a donation from Stephen Schwartzman is to set up an institute for ethics in AI. And one of the models we take here uh, that has some, I think, interesting um, readovers for us is what happened in the field of medical ethics over a number of decades. So as the medical uh, sciences became ever more capable and were transformed by a whole range of engineering and scientific breakthroughs, ethical challenges were faced. I mean, in the early days, this was actually just a recognition that human subjects were exactly that, dignified, autonomous individuals, and that the respect they had to be paid by medical practitioners required a range of new methods and techniques now, you might not think it, but the notion of informed consent itself was a development in this area. The notion of equitable access to scarce resources. So as 
things like dialysis machines became available, what was very clear was that there was more demand than there was access. How could you even begin to make equitable access work? So the concept of dialysis suites was developed, the notion of being able to grade and triage patients. And in some areas, entirely new concepts needed to be derived and defined in the face of technological change. In a real sense, the concept of a brain death uh, came to be understood because it was now technically possible to keep individuals alive in some sense, but there was no uh, there was there, there was no uh, meaningful uh, conscious uh, experience for an individual. So the notion of brain death was developed and, and uh, diagnostic uh, methods developed with that. Or the notion of futility of care that, again, very ethically charged and difficult. At what extent, at what, at what point does medical science take a view that the trade-off between the benefits to the individual as against the costs to the wider system. How do those trade-offs work? And at what point do we consider that our science and technology is not providing the quality we wish? These are difficult questions. And what was very notable about medical ethics was the recruitment of a um, range of philosophical thinking, philosophical thinking in the 40s and 50s, 60s, that began to ask questions like, you know, what was the certainty of our knowledge in the area of medicine? How was language being used? Uh, what were the new concepts we would even need, the new kinds of ontologies to describe the things we were witnessing? An actual engagement of not just ethicists, but linguistic philosophers, people interested in epistemology, theories of knowledge became absolutely central to the development of rich medical ethical thinking. Uh, another individual who plays a, a large part in, in the framing of uh, ethics and uh, uh, in, in the Oxford context is the work of the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, who famously always claimed that situations are almost, always more complex and contested than people imagine. And the worst thing you can do is to reduce questions to simple forms of utilitarian preference. So he would have been very interested in this warp and weft of uh, philosophical thinking. So philosophy turns out to be a really essential part of the toolkit. And what is being proposed in the Oxford program is that as we seek to understand what a modern student who's coming through uh, what might have been PPE or, or a modern student who's coming through the computer science curriculum, what do they need to know about the ethical challenges they're facing or about the ways in which the problem has been confronted, is being confronted, has been confronted in the past? There's the philosophy of language, what do we mean? There's the ontology questions, what things are we in need of or need to be in the world? The question of epistemology, what do we know and how do we know that we know that information? And indeed, then the relationship between ethical systems to law and governance. And what we've done in Oxford is recognise that the ethical questions that I referenced earlier on of transparency, fairness, safety and privacy, they all need to be enmeshed within deep inquiry within a philosophical regime. And so one of the exciting features we're seeing in Oxford is this development, this co-development between the faculties of philosophy, um, faculties of computer science, faculties of information engineering and medicine coming together to tackle these questions together. Now, before I end, I just want to shout out for this question of um, Ethical AI is absolutely essential, but ethical data that informs the AI is every bit as relevant. And we talked about the platform companies, the challenges we face with uh, these kind of centralized architectures. And one of the things that we have been advocating uh, for in some parts of uh, the, uh, the data and uh, uh, computer science community is the fundamental premise of the value of open development. 
Now, Niels Bohr, uh, the famous uh, physicist, made uh, a great uh, plea for the importance of openness, uh, felt it was one way to get us over many of the challenges um, that we faced. In fact, famously, he wrote to um, the leaders of the great powers after the Second World War, pleading with them to share their nuclear secrets. Now, this was at a time when there was not a parity of understanding necessarily. And of course, it wouldn't necessarily be what uh, one of the uh, superpowers would think it ought to be doing sharing those secrets. Of course, ultimately, the knowledge became uh, more broadly uh, acquired and uh, uh, effectively, uh, that knowledge is now in the hands of a number of nation states and we are in a situation where we have this uneasy balance. There's a genuinely interesting question here about its equivalence in um, in so-called efforts to bring about sovereign AI, the dominance of one nation state over another in this field. I could imagine he might be saying, well, the secret here surely is, is the open science method. And open data, which has been uh, one of my other passions um, over the last uh, couple of decades, is the recognition that when it comes to science and development, it is so much more powerful if our data is made openly available. And how do we affect that? What are the ethics we put around data? And there was a time when even the human genome was being offered up for privatization, fortunately, uh, uh, and patenting. Fortunately, that, uh, that, that was uh, uh, overturned by, by, by uh, uh, far-sighted politicians. And the genome is now a human genome. It is now a public good and understood as such. And we can see in companies whose fundamental business model is open collaboration, a different view on what we're trying to prioritize as our core value. It's not monetization, it's access at the broadest level. More people using the product, accessing the data, using the encyclopedia, publishing off the platform. And in some sense, it's ironic that our uh, friends who have done extraordinarily important work in the engineering and science of building search engines, in some sense, were able to do that because they used one of the great open assets that humanity had built collectively, the hyperlinks that we had all made between the documents on the web, which were then harvested and analyzed, and the page rank providing us uh, insights as to round search that was relevant to us. So there really is here, I think, some interesting questions that we need to ask when it comes to the ethics of data as well as the algorithms. And what we do at the Open Data Institute is try and research the methods and processes that lead to a trustworthy data ecosystem. And that's something I'd like to consider uh, uh, as, as I just close out this lecture. The Open Data Institute is based down now in the Knowledge Quarter in London, just across from the Crick Institute and the uh, and DeepMind and the new Google HQ and uh, the Alan Turing Institute there. And there's a really interesting uh, aggregation of organizations who are thinking about future potentialities. The ODI is very much about trying to build collectively common assets to allow us to build remarkable products that actually uh, uh, enable us to move everybody's uh, horizons and capacities forward. And this was, of course, Tim's original um, vision for the web. It's why I think he feels quite strongly that we need to recapture some of those original organizational principles. And as we think about the potentiality of the deployment of AI algorithms, let us not forget the absolute power of the deployment of the data behind those algorithms for a general and public good. So I will stop there and I would be happy to take questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Tim. That, uh, sorry, Nigel, that was uh, excellent. Um, truly thought provoking. I think we've got quite a good a few questions in the Q and A session. So, do you want to uh, 
make a start on those. Let me have a look. Um, I am sure I might even recognize some of the people asking those questions. So let me just, uh, <laughs> wow, that is a lot of questions. <laughs> right, let's see where they start. Um, oops, okay, so. Um, Full control of AI technologies on humanity and human life. Examples you're thinking of, please. Okay, I can't, can I see all of the chat here? Or am I just seeing the moderated one, uh, host and panelists? So Nigel, I, I followed up on that one with um, uh, Shmel and um, he's, he's interested in how much AI could fully manage human society and other digital technologies. Um, the, quite a few other questions related to this okay well if you actually what would be great andrew rather than my my kind of uh, um uh having to kind of process both the question filtering and thinking of a sensible answer at the same time yeah if you if you could perhaps do a uh, uh, pass them on to me that'd be great so uh just 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 rephrase that uh so i think that was a well um there was a question really about the ability of ai to fully manage human society. I guess that's leading on from the concept of um, human social value uh, with a credit system uh, that you, you mentioned. Um, it's quite a far reaching question. Yeah, I mean, it is It is a far reaching question. And I, I think it's, it's the right question to be considering, of course, is that if we offload um, huge amounts of consequential human decision-making to algorithms, at what point do you do you, do you call a halt to that or what oversight do you put into those processes? Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, traditions in um, human society of the brightest, latest technology coming along and trying to optimise the human to fit the system rather than saying, what are the essential human values we're trying to promote here? And I think that's what the ethical approach will often do is try and remind you that um, whose values are we trying to support? There's a, a great quote uh, um, um, back to one of the original founders of ethics, of course, Immanuel Kant, who has this kind of plea who says, you know, act in a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. And it's the kind of injunction to say, we are not means, human beings are ends in themselves. And so uh, we need to kind of factor that in. Now, of course, then there's the question about how you deal with questions like extreme uh, individualism on the one hand and the collective good on the other. And we can see where we can immediately get with conundrums like that through the pandemic we've been in, where people have been quite concerned that AI has been used to, in various uh, contexts, in various countries to do, if you like, network tracking to understand what the potential transmission uh, uh, vectors might look like. And people feeling that there was this overarching um, uh, uh, surveillance system in place. Uh, who's to say it would be kept within just public health? And then the question is immediately, about proportionality and whose interests are being served by that. Because on the other hand, you can see various public health arguments made legitimately that say, it's not just my individual good that is paramount, it is also the interests of groups and larger collectives. Uh, and so then you're talking about framing governance in the context of what's the grain size, what's the group, who are the interested parties here that we need to take into account? And it can't be, one hopes, some notion of an authoritarian state that thinks it absolutely knows what's in the best interests of all of its individual uh, members. Yeah. Thank you, Nigel. Um, the next question, could an AI system reliably reason about ethics? Could it reason about ethics? Yeah, that's uh, actually, and again, very good, very good point, because not just in ethics, but also in law, there have been various attempts to provide automated support for or decision logics that try and follow through the application of, of rules that are both regulatory or legal, now ethical. Um, and of course, uh, no um, ethical system 
uh, would claim to be entirely entirely normative in this well some might want to be but they're not necessarily the most the, the, the most uh, the ones you want to, to to lean on but i mean the essence of a lot of ethical systems is they try and represent a plurality of positions and to try and represent the complexity of context rather than just have a have a have a have a, have a simple uh, equation you're optimizing for i mean of course forms of utilitarianism might to some feel like that could be implemented as a as, as a as a formula or as an algorithm um, if we could measure the desired outcomes and have some way to optimize for them why wouldn't the greatest good for the greatest number be an organizational principle we'd adopt there are contexts in which you could imagine that would be uh, uh, an approach but it's always going to be countered by people who worry about limit cases edge cases so i rather think that rather than having overarching an overarching theory you're more likely to have competing theories or competing accounts and what you really want is to be able to have a system that presents alternative formulations and ultimately allows i i mean i feel quite strongly the human to stay in the loop um routine decision making we're already aware of that i mean where our algorithms annoyingly determine that we have part where we shouldn't or, and then we've got an entire appeal process that doesn't always peel, uh, uh, appear to be as fair-minded as you might think it should be um we're aware that when we uh, just offload um to algorithms then we do want to put in place human processes to try and address but too often those processes feel highly automated as well so i think the question that's being asked is absolutely the right one is what systems level thinking do we need to bring together so that there is always a, a, a human against which we can reasonably ask, you understand the context more broadly than the machine ever can. This is a complicated trade-off in this context. Surely there are uh, exceptions that define a, 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 an effective legal system as well as simple rule following. And we see that, of course, in the great appeal at the moment, in our courts between people who feel that the law says X and jury Y acquits um, um, a defendant uh, Z. Uh, and, and that's sometimes how human decision-making has to work and seem to be fair to do that. Sorry, I just dropped, you dropped from a moment, are you still there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Fantastic. I can. Yeah, yeah. I think it's my connection. I do apologize. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are such good questions coming through and there are so many of them. So it's hard for me to choose. Um, and I'm hoping Jeff will jump in soon as well. But um, Vicky asked the question, what does an AI disaster look like? Are there any notable examples? <laughs> What's an AI disaster look like? That is a great question. Um, no, no. And things like the you know cars crashing into yeah yeah I mean like I mean they, they, yeah in a in a sense um, it's been quite uh, uh, impressive the extent to which humans have been uh, yeah kept in the loop but there are car crashes and of course automotive uh, um, AI software in, in autonomous vehicles is a good example of that and you know and, and just right now in the last few days people were terribly worried by. Tesla software that allows uh, uh, cars to creep forward through the stop sign and so on. And the, and the question there is, um, the world is always complicated enough that there are um, cases that haven't been anticipated where a system might fail less than gracefully. There's a lot of examples you can point to across the history of computing, not just AI, where control systems were inappropriately baselined. I think people are quite uncomfortable about the application of biometrics. So face recognition, you could argue, is an area that is heavily contested, not least because people are unhappy about the representativeness of the training sets that were used to get the original performance. So we know that law enforcement agencies in different parts of the world and in, and in a number of states in the US and cities in the US have simply stopped using um, facial recognition algorithms um, uh, for suspect identification, these kinds of things. So yes, there are. Uh, and I think it's uh, it raises all sorts of interesting questions about um, what are the methods for validation and verification for um, 
uh, informing the original design rationale to work out. Um, again, it's as much about the data that informs many of these learning environments in particular as it is about the, uh, uh, the algorithm itself. So I guess related to that is an, another question, how would you factor in cultural dif differences into ethical standards? Yeah. Well, they've done, and there's some very interesting work on this. Um, um, the um, uh, MIT, um, th th there's been work that has tried to uh, basically um, <clears throat> crowdsource different solutions to the famous, again, Oxford generated trolley problem. You know, this is the variations of the, qu of, of the challenge, uh, which has been reframed, for example, in autonomous vehicles. Uh, little old lady and mother with child in pushchair crossing the road, catastrophic uh, 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 failure. Our system has to decide between uh, um, uh, knocking over one item, uh, what, what one object or the other. So, do you value um, the young child and mother over the little old lady crossing the road? And uh, varieties of that question were posed to different uh, um, geographies. And it was quite clear that there was a set of different preferences about what should be preserved. And uh, you might not be surprised to learn that in a whole variety of these tests, um, the, there was a deference to age in some societies and uh, that wasn't there in others. There were different choices made. A whole variety of these test cases were put up. But that is quite an interesting example that begins to illustrate that you would expect there is cultural variation. Um, where are the absolutes? Are there absolutes? What do they look like? I and mean, that's that's a live set of questions for people who do work in these areas. And of course, think about regulation that works across different jurisdictions. So yes, there's a, a, a rather good question from Sheila here. Uh, can we and how can we enforce ethical decisions we collectively make? Is there any international platform to decide on what is ethical? So. That's possibly related to what we're discussing now. Can you just repeat that? I've, 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 just, if, I've just got distracted by the GCA level, the, the mutant algorithm. We'll come back to that one. If right. in a minute. I can't let <laughs> one, that one pass. Yeah, OK, yeah, sorry. Is there any international platform? To, this is from Sheila Lord Lyons. Is there any international platform to decide on what is ethical? Yeah. So how do we decide and enforce, enforce ethical decisions we collectively make? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, um, you, there are a variety of multilateral organisations that have gotten very interested in AI codes and ethics. There is a UN, there's a UNESCO mandated, there, are, there is the EU, EU parliament. There are discussions with our own, own parliament on these questions. There are equivalent organizations in China, in the US, um, who are reflecting on um, the questions of rules and regulations around AI, but around what is ethical. And of course, that very quickly touches on questions of, uh, of what is legal or, or, or what are the rights-based approach that humans might expect under different um, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and, you know, there will be some some common standards. Again, the United Nations would promote some of these in the context of, of, of wider rights, uh, the uh, uh, EU uh, human rights uh, 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 are established as protocols in a number of key countries. They don't give you all of the answers to these ethical codes. They, set, they, they, they lay down expectations around things like a right to a private life, for example, which then have to be interpreted within the context of what is happening in our in our, our modern technology. So it is genuinely interesting when you see these two things bump into one another. Uh, when we see what's happening with um, uh, concerns around uh, surveillance, IoT devices, and whether or not that sits happily with the ethical presumptions and assumptions in the country. And you may know, it's an interesting fact, that in Germany, um, uh, a variety of uh, visual identification algorithms are not allowed to identify faces. You cannot identify the individuals. You can identify the particular number plate in question if you want to kind of work out a parking, but the face is obfuscated. And I think that 
the fact you can, and that goes down to a deep antipathy within the um, uh, perhaps obvious historical reasons within the German um, population and society for um, direct uh, recognition uh, methods for individual surveillance. Yeah. Okay. There's another one, another one here, a change of gear, maybe slightly away from the core ethical subject, but um, a, a practical based question um, from Fintan. Um, which trades and professions would you consider at most risk of being taken over by AI? <laughs> Oh well, there you go. Well, yeah, clearly now, it's now, 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 obviously coders. Uh, no, <laughs> no. I mean, look, um, I'm. I should. Yeah, I, I'm not as. Um, I'm not as gloomy about this as some people are. Um, people have been telling us for ages that the machines will take all our jobs, hmm. uh, 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 and I can show a whole list of. Uh, front covers of magazines over the years that say the robots are coming for your jobs, the robots are coming for your jobs. And uh, of course, what happened is there is increasing automation. Um, often it's surprising what gets automated. And uh, it's not always the case that machines end up doing the drudge work either. I mean, sadly, it's quite the converse. Sometimes the uh, uh, humans are still left in the loop doing some quite, you might think of low, um, low, low value work. But I think in many, many cases, the point about our modern economies is that we need people uh, to be on the end of the production process to buy products and services. Uh, now, people talk about universal basic income as becoming the solution to that. I think human beings are incredibly innovative about inventing new ways to generate incomes. <laughs> Yeah, there are entire classes of profession that never used to exist. And whether it's kind of influencers on social media, whatever we might think of them, there are entire new forms of capital generation that come along. Um, and some of the ones that we're convinced are going to be disintermediated by uh, robots and AI any day now turn out to be very tenacious. And there was quite an interesting article, a write-up on the AI Watson system, uh, it was going to disintermediate most medical, uh, 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 most physicians in the US, it was claimed. Well, it hasn't happened. It turns out to be more complex, more difficult. Um, teachers, pretty safe. Um, so are there particular at risk um, uh, uh, segments of the economy? I'm not so sure. You know, will truck drivers be something that we will see in an age of autonomous vehicles? Well, not drivers, but possibly uh, oversight, uh, um, equivalent of guards. You know, they haven't take we haven't taken humans out the cockpit yet on our on our flight systems. Although people could argue that the performance of our automated air traffic systems is very good indeed and most of the errors that get documented are down to human error and not the machine error so we can have arguments about this but as societies we are loath to take people entirely out so i'm uh, i see more jobs being created than being destroyed most of the time and i'll take good. leisure i'll take uh, education i'll take social care all as examples where there is there are more jobs than there are people and not enough ai to go around Hey, Nigel, um, this one's a potentially a bit political, so I'll take the name of the company out of the question. Uh, what's your view on companies um, like large um, technology companies hiring AI ethics staff and then firing them when they come up with the un with uncomfortable findings? Yes, well, you know that is the uh, that is a really uh, I think interesting point about um, the extent to which any large however well-meaning uh, the company thinks it's being about this or well-behaved, the extent to which governance of the sort you need can actually be practised by the um, ultimately uh, oversight by the organisation itself. It's whether we believe an organisation could set up its own um, Supreme Court to make judgments about this or that, or uh, are its own ethicists going to have the ability to really... Um, uh, change and influence fundamentally business models. I think uh, companies have to be very acutely aware that if they are going to be serious about trying to understand 
the fundamental principles of equity, disequity, bias, um, representativeness, inclusiveness, then there are going to be some very tough questions that any organization will have to face and deal with in the face of that. And it has to have methods in place where the first instinct is to simply deny the problem is there at all and, um, and then be uh, uh, least capable of resolving these things uh, in a way that enjoys um, broad support. I mean, it, it's a difficult one because I think you really do need to find ways of putting in place structures and um, accountability that doesn't somehow have it all internalized because I think that's 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 difficult and and often in danger of ultimately being corrupted or subverted. So I think it's very good practice for organizations to stand up their own ethical review panels. That's absolutely essential. But you can expect there will need to be occasions when others, when regulators, when the public square get in the argument and say, this isn't really uh, acceptable behavior. And um, now, again, universities and uh, learned institutions, um, other organizations, professional bodies can play a role in helping us build uh, trusted uh, environments where there are different ways of appealing and uh, um, approving or assuring the standards are being followed. Thank you. There, there are lots of questions yeah. that turn things a bit on, on its head and ask about um, whether AI systems themselves can be held accountable. Should they have rights? Can they be punished? I mean, a, a lot of this is presumably pointing back to the recent um, uh, legal argument that um, companies, should, autonomous vehicle companies should be responsible rather than the drivers. Um, so is anybody developing ideas about the ethics and rights and, and, and associated of, of the AI systems themselves? Yeah, there's, there, there, is a, there is a line of thinking, and it, it's this rather interesting thought experiment, you know, it's the as if experiment. So, um, you know, what you can't, uh, what we don't want are uh, situations where there is there is no redress, that the redress in some sense is inappropriately focused or um, there's any deny, there's, a, there's no hope of natural justice because there aren't structures to uh, litigate against. So the notion of legal personhood that attaches to a company is uh, quite a powerful one uh, and an important one that we would want to uh, we would want to uh, probably read over into the notion of systems designed uh, AI systems designed by corporations. And I think that uh, now, of course, the deeper question about whether there are then inherent rights that attach to the system, such as a right to be left alone or whatever. I think that that's that's a stage on, and I'm I'm not. At this stage, I don't think getting into questions around um, whether um, types of AGI or types of sophisticated uh, the bicentennial man model is is something we need to be. At. I think the question is much more about who originates the the uh, and designs and builds and deploys these systems. And uh, it's much the same argument we're getting into with uh, with the platforms where. Uh, they claim uh, uh, not to be content uh, providers on the one hand, simply uh, communication channels. Uh, and, and you know there is an argument that at some point society has to find balanced ways in which um, entities can be held accountable. Thank you very much. There is indeed a published academic literature on the impact of AI and jobs, and some of it's out of the Oxford Martin School here. Um, some of those, I mean, it's interesting to kind of measure up on, on, on how earlier predictions about those impacts have been modified uh, through time. So, uh, again, this is very much work in progress. And I think colleagues who work in, in social sciences and the economics of this are, 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 are often um, um, really... Uh, um, uh, engaged with trying to find good and uh, um, um, valid data sets. There's a couple of questions with regard to comparing uh, China and uh, so the East and the West in terms of um, ethics. Um, 
uh, what are your comments in terms of um, how we would handle differences? I know you mentioned earlier that there may be cultural differences, but uh, I mean the, the what we're dealing with the, the web is is very global. Um, yes, I mean it's uh, it's a question that is uh, asked a lot. Um, the uh, it's back to this question of. Um, what different societies believe represents the prime, uh, a primary or an important locus of interest. Mm. And, uh, you know, you will hear lots of accounts of uh, particular societies having a more communitarian view. And that is how you have to understand how they express their rules and preferences, as opposed to more uh, individualistic uh, um, uh, philosophies. And, and, and you can see that literally it's been in play through the pandemic, hasn't it? I mean, you can you can you can see how how people uh, get very agitated about those differences or about their perceived rights and entitlements, uh, whose rights and entitlements, who's making those decisions. Um, and I think that uh, we do have to work out how we can um, engage in discussions. I mean, in some sense, it's interesting to see what's happened around data regulation law where there have begun to be divergences around different jurisdictions view about what is protected what is allowed what it's what you're able to do in terms of uh, additional inference over over data and uh mm -hmm. some jurisdictions see that as a uh as, as a special feature as something that actually seeks uh, to protect citizens or in some other contexts seeks to enhance commerce. And I think those arguments are ones that um, uh, nation states have with their populations in some sense. Um, and where you find points to find common cause, like what does adequacy mean between one regime and another to allow information to share, those are exactly the discussions that are being held right now. And I think it's uh, um, I don't think there are absolute. Um, um, uh, no absolute answer. No absolute answer on this. It is mm. about coming up with multilateral ag agreements where things are actually traded off against mm -hmm. the different preferences that some organisations have. You hope, recognising that there are some areas where there is a mutuality of recognition that these are just bad outcomes that you don't want um, AIs having the. Uh, first strike capability without the human in the loop for example mm -hmm. okay there's so, a there's actually a, another question about that somebody's desperate to uh, to ask the question please say something about autonomous weapons and how to ban them mm. you, you just touched on yeah and there is and there's a there's a, there's a group of uh um scholars and organizations who are very seized on this and they they make the very good point that this isn't a this this is something which in um offensive and defensive capabilities you know uh nation states are used to doing in other spheres so uh however effectively or not it's policed uh, in biological and chemical there are these established conventions now they may be violated by individual states or bad actors but there are these conventions in place now the question is what's the equivalent within um within the general um uh, use of ai and that that's partly difficult because this is the ultimate general purpose technology so it's uh, you know i can put some ai into a kinetic uh munition or i can put it into a drone or i can put it into a landmine and you know what are we uh what 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 are we looking to outlaw and, and of course in sense some sense the, the landmine example is quite interesting because there are real efforts to try and stop proliferation. Notwithstanding that, there are millions of these things <laughs> covering the planet. So um, I think people are thinking about this, uh, and I know they are, and there are people who would like to just rule some of this stuff out completely. But when you look at what's coming out of various national strategies in this area, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not looking as imaginative or foresight, farsighted as you might think. And the where it's particularly egregious is actually not in hot, 
kinetic weapons. It's in cyber offensive and defensive capabilities where there is effectively an undeclared set of operations on the on the web, day in and day out, denial of service attacks, on and on and on, and no regulated grown-up behaviour that says this should not be tolerated by uh, by advanced nation states. But um, we haven't even got there yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, referring back to access to data and and your, your slide earlier on, where where we were collecting data from the different marketing resources. There's a specific question here from Elaine, which says, how can research commissioning, the research commissioning process ensure transparency and open data? Uh, maybe I'd sort of add a rider to that. I mean, something that's interesting, I'm, I'm particularly interested in personally, is how we in the West, the UK, improve the, the, our health population by this, this massive amount of data, that we, the, the health of our population. So when we're commissioning research, developing this stuff, how, how, how do we share this data? How do we yeah. make use? How do we improve our health in the UK? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. I mean, that is a great, it's, it's a great question as well. I think, um, and the pandemic has been really quite, a terrible but a, a, an interesting forcing function on this so you know I'm, I'm i'm an open data advocate i think it should be a platform on which we build a lot of our capability but not all of it there are clearly classes of data that have to remain more um, carefully curated shared much more limited fashion uh in some cases essential to keep in very small circulation so there's lots of strains of, of varieties of data. I rather see it as a bit of a pyramid where at the bottom you want a big open slab of open data if you can have it. Now in health data, uh, that means, you know, are there anonymized large data um, asset aggregate data that can help us all? And I think they're clearly the case. Everything from mobility data, which has been suitably anonymized through to data around uh, uh, large scale data. Um, uh, um, disease or drug effects or responsiveness. What we are now seeing is the emergence of what are called trusted research environments, which are safe enclaves of data, where there are high levels of security about how the data is held. Uh, it is linked. So in, in uh, England, um, the national health patient record data is being linked so that models can be run to find things like comorbidities, you know, what's a susceptibility to COVID, uh, what, what COVID infection outcomes were given individual patients had other underlying conditions or responsive to drugs. That kind of work's been happening in these trusted research environments where models are developed on the outside, tested on synthetic data, then submitted to the actual real linked data inside the environment and the results are uh, emitted in an appropriately anonymized or aggregated or fine grain way, uh, way, depending on what the requirement was. I think there are lots of new actual architectures that allow us to be much more um, effective about how we use this public data at scale in a way that I think would retain public trust as well. And I think this is a lot of this has done some really interesting developments in data engineering. Yeah. There's another question here from Mario. It's, it's slightly tautologist, but do you think that AI will ever be ethical because it's learning from humans and humans are fallible? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to take you back to uh, uh, good old Isaiah Berlin. He talked about the, the crooked timber of humanity, right? So we okay. know, we know people are good, bad, and indifferent. You know, there are, there are, there are uh, this idea that there is an ultimate kind of uh, angelic disposition, which, which we should all aspire to be. I, in truth, you know, we are full of dissonances and clashes and conflicts in our views, in our behaviours, uh, but we understand something about what good behaviour looks like or decent behaviour or civility or or a degree of tolerance. I, th I, th I think what's really interesting about um, this period in the 21st century is uh, a recognition that some of our civics have just broken 
and, and how do we re-establish them? And I, that is partly about um, you know, paying attention to the ethics of what treating one another as dignified ends in themselves actually means, you know, uh, uh, and respecting the fact that we can have different views. Uh, I don't hold with the view that there is a normative model that we should all aspire to follow. That would be a very tedious world anyway, I think. Um, and the idea that we have to take instruction from an algorithmic master who has this kind of uh, perfect 2020 vision on what perfect outcomes look like for the human race. Now, of course, you then throw up examples like, well, even, you know, you don't have to be fully AGI to recognize, to have an algorithm tell you that uh, the way we're running out of resources on the planet is, is suboptimal. So surely uh, there are ways uh, that we can, I, I, I'm convinced that we can use our computational models and methods to alert ourselves to the most egregious consequences of what we do and visualize that very graphically. Um, I don't know that I, uh, 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 any of us would want to trust the algorithms to make the decisions for us. Um, although in some science fiction writing, that is ultimately what happens. <laughs> yeah. um, where is it? Edward was asking, any, any more views on alpha code? Well, literally, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, um, I think that what, what the median level is and looking at the examples and uh, uh, the question that was being asked was, of course, it's one thing to produce a reasonable code for function X. It's deciding that function X is the thing that needs to be implemented or the set of functions strung together to achieve a particular outcome. Uh, those things still seem to me to be in the in the hands of the designer uh, or requirements analysis process. But I can imagine you're seeing it, aren't you, with a number of code uh, facilitation uh, environments where there's auto completion, there's all sorts of error checking that's going on in real time, and uh, the extent that the systems can be um, threading elements together for. Um, Initially, it might be for, for rather routine um, um, block assembly of components. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think we'll see some 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 advances in that area. But um, it's a bit. I haven't really um, had a chance to digest where they feel they've got to. It has been a bit of a holy grail, and there've been lots of different approaches to automatic program uh, uh, writing over the years. And uh, again, uh, the styles of programming. Um, you know, different programming languages come with very fundamental, if you like, um, semantics. So if I'm programming in a procedural language or a functional language, the very different ways of assembling. So again, we interesting to see how, how those sorts of parameters are taken into account. But it's likely to be a place where there will be some uh, um, automation um, in the same way that uh, we're seeing that with what we author and what we design and uh, what we paint and what we imagine. I think, unfortunately, we, we're coming to the end of our time slot, which is uh, a bit sad because I think we could probably talk all night on this. Uh, I think we, yeah, I think we'd be here all evening. I, I would <laughs> yes. just, I would just personally like to say thank you so much to everybody who's, who's posed interesting questions. I'm still scrolling through them. To, um, yeah, and a shout yeah. out also to the fact that uh, there is a there is a real tradition. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a great uh, um, uh, set of uh, work um, here in Oxford around the whole concept of of when we build our systems to responsibly innovate in them and uh, responsible innovation, um, 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 the work of Marie, you know, Jiroka and others, calling attention to the fact that um, it's not just about retrofitting ethical guidelines after the fact, it's actually about imagining at the outset the, the purposes and context for which systems are being built and asking these questions, the questions about is what we're innovating, is what we're trying to achieve, achieve um, responsible in, in, in a broad and diverse set of contexts. Mm. So I, I, I apologise to those who haven't had their questions answered. 
we're running out of time. Is there one, just to put you on the spot, Nigel, is there one or two books that you would refer people to um, relating to tonight's subject? So I'm just thinking that what, you know, what's, what's in the forefront of your mind if we um, suggested one or two books for, for those that uh, have been asking questions but didn't get them answered. My, well, my everybody should rush me. out immediately and buy The Digital Ape, uh, which is a fine book by myself and Roger Hanson. <laughs> uh, partly, because, but partly because it's it's not just about ethics, but it's about our inter, uh, our, uh, the extent to which we are interfacing with smart machines and how our technology has always been shaping us at the same mm. time we've been shaping our technologies. Um, in terms of um, ethics, yeah, I mean, there's there's there's, there's quite a few there's quite a few uh, um, texts starting to merge uh, around the topic. I mean, any particular? Uh, I always feel a bit invidious to kind of call one out over the others. Um, yeah, yeah, I appreciate. Um, I put you, I put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd be certainly happy to kind of. Uh, uh, Put a, uh, a little reading resource together. Post oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be just really a, good. Just yeah. I mean, there are there are the, they, they are the, there are the um, there are the books by um, actually a notable set uh, uh, of uh, 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 female um, AI ethicists. One's just been called out there, which is Sophia's Noble's work uh, on mm. algorithms of oppression. There is work by Alondra Nelson, who doesn't talk about AI per se. She talks about uh, um, uh, she especially looks at, 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 at genomics and uh, spillover effects and the ethical conundrum that you have when you've got techniques that can um, identify um, potential perpetrators of crimes through, you know, um, genealogical analysis, all sorts of kind of second order effects when you get the kind of power of a technology and what the ethics need to be around that. So the social life of DNA there is um, work, of course, Invisible Women by Caroline Grado Perez is very extremely good book that won a, uh, the, the Royal Society. Um, and that was the uh, attack on the fact that so much of what we design and imagine mm -hmm. in the world in general, but in computing in particular, is fundamentally, um, um, yeah, uh, does not represent uh, half of the uh, human population effectively. And uh, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Well, all I can say to, to wrap up, Nigel, is just incredibly thought-provoking, and thank you very much. I'm sure you've seen all the super comments that have come up on the chat saying what an excellent talk this has been. Absolutely. What we expected and, and what you always deliver. So, oh, my um, pleasure. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I think I, I wasn't quite sure. I, I, my camera's a bit weird, so I can often seem like I'm staring off into the right-hand side rather than into the camera. But my apologies if I, if I was ranging around. But it's been a great uh, pleasure talking uh, to you all and uh, look forward to meeting uh, many of you in person before long. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nigel. Thank you very much. Thank Take care. Good. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Brian. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.